Team, I got a couple of, of mulligans, things I meant to get to earlier in the show, but I got so wrapped up in the in-depth political analysis that I missed. One was the bizarre rushing of the stage situation at the Biden, uh, basically, victory speech, where Dr. Jill Biden, and by the way, is she an MD or is she like a PhD? I got to think about this. I don't know if you're a PhD if we all have to run on calling you doc. What do we do we know what what is producer Mark, would you tell me please when you get a second, what is Jill Biden's why is she a doctor? I I I'm sorry. Doctor is really I mean, I, I know people get mad at me for saying this. Doctor is for MD. Uh, I know people like because they have a doctorate. I don't know if you have a doctorate in French philosophy if we have to call you doctor your whole life. In a quick Google search, it's a doctorate in uh, education. <sighs> Ooh, survey says, Bam. sorry, doesn't doesn't cut the mustard for the buckster. Doesn't do it. Nope. A doctorate in education does not make you doctor. I mean, you know, just like an if you get an honorary doctorate in the humanities because you donate a lot of money to some place. People don't have to call you doctor, all right? So I think that's interesting. Oh, doctor Jill Biden all the time. Nope, sorry. Jill Biden. Anyway, Jill Biden uh, got a lot of press because she stood in between the crazy vegan protesters and her uh, and her husband. Remember, they, they, they were yelling, let dairy die! Uh, dairy now is c- cow slavery is a is a thing. This is a uh, a recurring left wing cause. All of, ever since Joaquin Phoenix got up at the Oscars and spoke about this, um, we're gonna we're gonna continue to be told this. I mean, you know, at, at some level, the circle of life it's the circle of life uh, requires animals eating other animals, animals uh, taking from other animals. That's just uh, otherwise nothing lives, right? I mean, we've all learned about the food. Uh, the food chain, we all understand that there's, you know, alpha predators, and then it goes all the way down to the the baseline organisms necessary to sustain an ecosystem, right? We took, like, fifth grade science. Hashtag science. You know, should we be cruel to animals? Never. Are we going to rely on animals for food, for milk, for stuff? Yes. It's not going to change. Not anytime soon. You know, I know that everyone's running around saying that we're supposed to love these, you know, impossible burgers and these other things. I've had them. They're okay. It's just like having a salted chickpea patty, basically. I mean, it's okay. Not horrible. They're not great. It's not a burger. Not even close. Never in your life will you, you know, so far would you sit there and be like, oh, why am I eating this delicious, you know, ground beef, 80% lean, you know, good old fashioned American burger when I could be having this patty? made to look like a burger with, like, 50 different ingredients in it that does not... Have you ever had one of these, by the way, Producer Mark? I have not. The Beyond the... Impossible... My, my wife uh, made me go get an Impossible Whopper for her because she doesn't they eat They sell beef. them now, yes. right? She doesn't eat beef because it upsets her stomach, not because she's against it. But yeah, she she's not a it. communist, I understand. Yeah. Like, I, I don't eat gluten, not because I'm a communist, but because I can't. Yeah, it does. But uh, she liked it. She enjoyed it, but I guess she doesn't really understand what beef tastes like. But, I mean, can we... I don't want to put too much on your, on your plate here. Uh-huh. I don't want to uh, put too much on your plate, but, I mean, can we get producer Mark's review of, a, of an Impossible Whopper fine. sometime soon? I will soon? go buy an Impossible Whopper. Just buy burger. one, you know. Take a bite. You don't think the whole thing. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I'll take a bite out of my wife's. Yes. Ask your wife next time for a bite of hers. She's not very a big fan of me eating her food, though. It's funny. I'm not a sharer, really, either. Yeah. You know, some people, like, some members of my family like to create the instant buffet of, like, you get this, and I'll get this, and we'll share, and we'll... Ma-. No, 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 no. no. I, like, I like it to be my zone. I get my food. That's what I'm eating. And you know, romantic partner, I, you know, girlfriend, future wife, if I ever get one, they can eat off my plate, and that's fine, but, but I... Nobody else. Nobody so, else. I'm okay with it with my wife, and obviously in an appetizer situation. Well, yeah, appetizer, shared appetizer. Sticks. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I'm. Yeah. We're you know, we're not animals. Of course, we yeah, can yeah, share yeah. appetizers. But yeah, but people start splitting entrees. No, I. Can't I'm not do an entree it. split guy. No, I. I'll take a taste of somebody else's entree, and you can have a taste. I will cut off a piece of my steak because that's always the right move to order. Sure. And I'll share it with the person that decided to get the the roast scrod or whatever. But no, 
they, 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 we're not doing this like cutting it up in half and, and ruining the presentation yeah, to like, share. Uh, my in-laws like to order a bunch of entrees at, at Chinese food and then share them all. No, I want my own. I will own. tell you, my family, we grew up doing that too. I, Chinese I like food, it. I feel like, is a little different. Don't you want the variety I, with the Chinese food? I guess. My wife and I aren't Chinese food compatible, we've learned. What is your? What are your favorite like, Chinese food Like, she likes dishes? pork fried rice, but I prefer like a chicken or beef fried rice. I mean, pork fried rice is the correct answer. I don't. You I, tell I, Ariel I don't, that she's correct on this one. All right. I, I don't think pork so. fried rice is the way to go. What are your three orders in a Chinese restaurant? Keep in mind, there's one restaurant I can still go to where they make every Chinese dish okay. gluten free, so I can still uh, keep it real here. I like chicken with garlic sauce, the spicy sauce. Yes. Uh, I like. I I always liked sweet and sour chicken when I was a kid. The fried mm-hmm. one. That's mm-hmm. uh, General Sow's chicken. I'll do sesame chicken occasionally. I like to mix it up. Yeah. Beef and broccoli. I'm a big fan of. I. Pork fried dumpling, mm-hmm. fried rice, general so chicken. For me, the only problem with getting that is I will eat it so quickly and so mm-hmm. excessively that like I don't even want to know what the I I, I probably put away a day and free? a half of caloric content with that one meal. Other than the rice, how is that gluten free though? Uh, it's uh, they just use gluten free flour. Oh okay. And they use and there's gluten free. The tamari sauce is a soy sauce alternative that's gluten free. So you just use gluten-free flour and tamari sauce, and you're good. Everything else is pretty much easy. I didn't know you could do gluten-free dumplings. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gluten-free flour. Yeah, rice flour is gluten-free. that you can have that isn't ruined. Yes. Well, there's only one place in all of New York City that I know of where you can get it gluten-free. It's actually very good, Hmm. and that's it. Uh, But obviously, I grew up eating Chinese food with my family, and that was the thing. Obviously, pizza you share. Like, I'm not crazy. Uh, But I just don't like like entree splitting at restaurants. No, that's ridiculous. You know, entree tasting, fine. Entree splitting. What are we? You know what I mean? My wife will very rarely even give me a bite of her food. I mean, you know, she likes what she likes. Yeah. And she does, you know, you, you should have ordered better. I don't know what to say. I also don't like when I try to convince somebody. This is happening many times on dates. I'm like, I don't, you know, they're like, well, do you think I'll like this? I'm like, no, I think, I think you should get this instead. And then they won't get it. But then I'll get the thing that I said would be better. And then they're like, I don't really like mine. I want more of yours. I'm like, I told you. Yeah. I'm a, are you, I, I'm an A plus orderer, I will say. I've made mistakes. I know what the best. There. Yeah, I mean, you got to live on the edge a little bit, but I yeah. I usually get the best stuff that I of anybody at. You know, I know what I know what to get at a place. Uh, I'm glad. Yeah, I, you know, I do what I can, uh, and even for other people that with the glutinous food, I can kind of help them out. Anyway, so vegan. Let us know about the Impossible Whopper, producer Mark, when you can. I will. We'll, he'll give us a full review. We'll go to the penalty box for Mark's review, and I, I just it doesn't taste as good. This whole vegan militancy thing, though, is not surprising to me because there's always been a little bit of this. There have been militant vegans for a long time. And I, I've met vegans who say, oh, it's not about that. It's about my health. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, how do you feel about those vegans that are militant, though? The ones that think that, you know, bee slavery needs to end because we shouldn't be taking the honey from the bees. Uh, you know, how do, how do we really feel about that? And ultimately, I just want to know why is it, you know, why is it bad to, to eat honey, which some vegans will tell you it is bad. You know, we shouldn't be taking the honey from the animals. Because the same thing with, with cows, we're not, I mean, I like eating cows too, but taking their milk isn't killing them. Uh, y- you would ask yourself, well, why is it okay to eat plants? They don't want to die. Plants are living creatures too. And if we can't, if we can't consume any form of life, we can't survive as a species. So really, what are we doing here? What are we talking about? I'm just saying. So eat your General Tso's chicken. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's the best. I don't, but just don't ever check. The amount of sodium and sugar and fat in that is, ooh, man. Americanized Chinese food is, uh, is a thing that can help you put on the LBs, I can tell you. So Jill Biden tried to protect her husband from vegan, and I, I didn't mention that. Bernie Sanders, by the way, we got one more clip. for Play, play clip 12, will you? President Trump, stay out of the Democratic primary. Why don't you do your job for a change as president? Stop lying. Stop running a corrupt administration. Pay attention to the American people, not just your own uh, political aim. Uh, stay out of the primary. This is, a, this is a thing that we've been hearing from Democrats a lot now. I think it's interesting because do you think Bernie, and this is, this is the mulligan I wanted to get to, do you think Bernie recognizes that if Elizabeth Warren, Elizabeth Warren, she's still out there on the war path. Do you think that she's, uh, do you think that he's recognized that she stayed in this race? Maybe not just out of vanity, maybe because she was told you got to stay in the race. She hurt Bernie in some key states where Bernie would have definitely had, because you got to figure that the person who's siphoning the most votes off from Bernie in this primary 
is Elizabeth Warren. So do you think he's recognized that she's his ideological ally, supposedly, but she's not going anywhere. She's staying in this as long as she can. Yeah. The only people that I've ever really come across that seem to really like Elizabeth Warren. She lost her home state of Massachusetts. Think about that. She lost her own state. Uh, the, the only people I've come across that really like Elizabeth Warren are smug lib journos. They, they think she's great. They're really all about it. And I just wonder what, was, what she has been promised behind the scenes in order to continue to stay in this primary as essentially a, a Bernie spoiler. Because that's, that's really what she is at this point. There's nothing else that she's doing. She's a Bernie spoiler. So you'd think that the progressive candidates at this point, if they care as much about dramatic change in this country as they say they do, uh, she'd be willing to step aside as Buddha Judge and Klobuchar were, but nope. Now, why is that? Do we think that maybe Elizabeth Warren could be the olive branch a Biden administration would extend to progressives, or at least that would be the promise? Maybe you have Elizabeth Warren as, I don't know, Treasury Secretary. Oh, you think that's so crazy? I don't think that the libs think that's so crazy. Maybe that's what happened here, because there's no other good explanation for why Warren would still be sticking it out and still be in this process like this. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't add up. Unless you just think she's a total, a totally tone-deaf egomaniac, which is possible because she pretended to be a Cherokee uh, Native American for decades and decades of her life, when no person who is normal would say, yeah, that makes sense. It just as an aside, I watched, uh, I watched some of the Peter Pan, the original Peter Pan country, and I've gone back and watched some Disney classics recently. And uh, I'm amazed that they haven't tried to edit out. There's a lot of Native American stereotyping in the 1951 Peter Pan that Disney put out that I'm surprised they haven't tried to airbrush that all out, get rid of it all. It's still there. I can't even talk about it that much on air, but yeah, go back and watch it. You say, whoa, amazing how much the world has changed since then. And, uh, since, you know, what was considered completely sound and, and celebrated entertainment for children is now, is now not woke enough. Not woke enough. Uh, I'm just glad that at least in Lady and, and Lady and the Tramp, we can still do the Italian, he's a talking to me, you know? You can still do that one. I think we can still, Italian-Americans have enough of a sense of humor about Italian accents that you can get away with that. Hey, buongiorno. But, I don't know about how long. I, I Just give it time. They're going to complain. They got rid of Apu from The Simpsons. They got rid of him. Gone. Hank Azaria said, yep, sorry, I shouldn't have done it as long as we did. He's out. Character that was on the air for decades and was a successful small business owner and family man who often shed a lot of, a lot of wisdom on the situation of The Simpsons, but they didn't like his accent. They didn't like the stereotypes, so he's out. So you never know. Nothing, nothing is safe from the woke police. That much we do know. You know, market's up a little bit today. I, I guess we'll continue to do these these coronavirus updates as we can. The market seems to have had a little rebound. Bad day yesterday, very good day Monday, so it's very choppy right now. Uh, people coming in and out of the market. Uh, you know, don't try to catch a fallen knife, they say. Don't try to game the market out. If, you, if you're a long-term investor and you think that this is, which, which I am, and you think that this is going to uh, work itself out, then just pick sound investments for yourself. If you're somebody that you know, needs cash now, whatever, I mean, yeah, maybe you, maybe you de-risk a little bit. Maybe you take a little bit of a, you, you actually hedge, which it's funny because people always talk about hedge funds, but hedge funds don't really often do what their initial strategy was supposed to be, which is hedging. A lot of them just are massive investment pools. So, coronavirus, the interesting news today was that they think there may be two strains of it going around, and that one strain is much more dangerous, but less transmissible, less easy uh, for it to be passed on to others than the other strain. That would make sense to me. Latest reporting from the World Health Organization is that the mortality rate uh, the mortality rate of coronavirus is even higher than they thought. It's more, maybe more like 
That is contra the thesis that I've been advancing to you that I think that it's probably a lesser mortality rate because we don't know the number of cases. I'm not, I don't think that I'm wrong. I just think that they're having to adjust the numbers based on uh, the cases that are reported and the number of fatalities. It would, however, make sense to me that you might have two virus strains out there. This was reported today. You might have two virus strains that are very similar but different enough that one of them spreads pretty rapidly because people have low or no symptoms for the incubation period and uh, are less likely to self-quarantine. And that one may have a very, that strain may have more like a flu-level mortality rate, but then there's this other coronavirus strain that's already out there as well because the virus can, can change, can mutate, and that that one would have more like a 3 or 4% mortality, which, which is really scary. And now you get into, well, is, is that, an, this is just, it's a theory that has been put out there today. I think Daily Mail was reporting on it uh, based on what some medical experts are seeing. That's also a possibility. Um, look, you know, we're, we're going to get through this. There's no question about that. We're just trying to get through it with minimum, minimum loss of life, uh, loss of life, minimum disruption uh, to the economy. And uh, this is every administration has stuff come up that is not expecting. That's not the fault of the administration. It's true of every presidency. It's just the nature of life and the world we live in. There are things that happen. and the Trump administration's adaptation to this particular challenge, I think, has been so far strong. And hopefully we can continue to see the containment that there, there are public health experts. And, you know, for everyone who says, listen to the scientists. Yeah. When you listen to scientists on this, what you often find out is that they don't completely agree. So what does that mean to listen to scientists? You know, the left likes to boil this stuff down to talking points that don't really give us a whole lot to work work with. Is it the case that this is pretty much contained in some places or not? That's what we should begin to, uh, we, sh- we, we need to look at this and that's what we need to understand if we're going to have a pretty good projection for how well we'll be able to deal with this or not. Uh, so, you know, producer Mark and I are taking our vitamin C and trying to get enough sleep and trying to keep our immune systems immune systems up. I'm on the subway four times a day here in New York City every Monday through Friday. Think about that. I'm on four times a day. So I am I am being submerged in that, you know, human petri dish many, many, many times over. And I am vigilant, but I'm not concerned. I feel like everybody should that they should have that same mentality. I think that's the most appropriate way to view this situation. And uh, you know, let's just if we get this thing under control, the weather gets warmer. It looks like transmission will be going down, you know, by there is a there is a realistic possibility whereby, let's say, June or July, I think this is really in the rearview mirror. And we may have to continue the vaccine research and continue to prepare for this to be an, an addition uh, to the concerns over the normal flu season in this country. But that's something that we'll be able to manage. And I, I, I'm hopeful that we will get there soon. Time for roll call. If you want to email us, it's teambuck at iheartmedia.com. I want some first timers. You know, it's always great to see new people send in. You can even just send in a one liner. Hey, Buck, love the show. Producer Mark is hilarious. You guys are amazing. Peace. Like, you can always do that. We just like hearing from you. So please don't be shy. And facebook.com slash Buck Sexton, just send a message to that page and it'll come into us. Uh, and that's the easiest way. Or you can just type in Buck Sexton, you'll see my face, and that's me. Uh, so that's what, I, that's what I got for you. Um, I would say, oh, oh, one, one update before we get into some of the roll call stuff on the Chris Matthews departure from MSNBC, where he pretty much quit during a live broadcast on air, which I think some people were really kind of like, wow, about the whole thing. So, uh, Chris Matthews had come under pressure from what you could call the, the new the new acceptable standards of behavior and decorum in the office as a result of the Me Too era. And there's this piece in GQ that's now making the rounds from a, a female writer who claims not only that Chris, Ma- you know, that she's pulled together all these different people talking about how Chris Matthews was gross in different ways toward women who came on his show, uh, but that she herself had dealt with creepy Chris. And 
Speaking of creepy, the Joe Biden creepiness, the media is never going to talk about it. The sniffing, the grabbing women's heads and kissing their heads and all the weird stuff that he does. They're just going to pretend like that never happened. Don't Sorry, poke that in my face, okay, buddy? Yeah. So Chris Matthews, the, you know, some of the stuff that he said, look, it's not good. I mean, it's not stuff you'd want to It's not a professional thing to say. But for him to get, you know, taken out to the, you know, in the stockade on this one is a little bit of a, a little bit of a surprise, I think. Well, I shouldn't say it's a surprise. It's a little severe. It's not surprising. The Me Too era now. Whew. Rules. Rules are constantly changing about. I'm not, I'm not talking about people that assault people or break the law. I'm talking about comments now. What comments are acceptable in an office? Well, here, this is from this GQ piece. Quote, the number of on-air incidents is long, exhausting, and creepy, including commenting to Aaron Burnett, for example, you're a knockout. It's all right getting bad news from you. End quote. Is telling somebody they're a knockout, um, I mean, how offensive is that? Is it appropriate? No. Is it a cool thing to say? I mean, no, not really. But, you know, is that really? Let's keep in mind also women in the TV news business. uh, It's very interesting. You can't really talk. Appearance is a part of that business. People are evaluated on appearance. And sometimes contractually, they're obligated to maintain the appearance that they were hired with. So you can't all of a sudden go on air with like a pink mohawk, right? Could you, could they fire you if you gained, you know, 50, 100 pounds? I don't know, but I think they probably can make a case they could. So, you know, that, that puts you in this interesting position where people are benefiting from their appearance, but you can't comment on their appearance. Professionally benefiting from their appearance. Clearly. Hmm. That seems a little bit like it's a... That's a difficult area to gauge what's acceptable or what's not. All right, but let me go back to this GQ piece. Quote, behind the scenes, one of Matthew's former producers told the Daily Caller in 2017 that he allegedly rated his female guests on a numerical scale and would name a hottest of the week like a teenage boy. In 1999, an assistant producer accused Matthews of sexual harassment, which CNBC, the show's network at the time, investigated. They concluded that the comments were inappropriate and Matthews received a stern reprimand. So, yeah, he's a guy that says, like, dumb, inappropriate stuff about women pretty regularly. I think, I think that's, that's clear. Um, so, you know, MSNBC, the wokeness is going to get you. Quote, he has repeatedly lusted over women in politics on air, including remarking in 2011 that there's something electric and very attractive about the way former vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin walks and moves, and noting in 2017 that acting Attorney General Sally Yates is attractive, obviously. Obviously? Okay. Anyway, um, yeah. So this is, I just wanted to follow up with why, why did why'd they give Chris Matthews the boot? And this is why. Talking about how chicks are hot all the time, and that's not going to fly. And I tell you now, I would know walking on the office, you know, you don't talk about, don't talk about chicks being hot in the office. That's for sure. That's a bad move. But it is interesting. What are the limits on what you can say about public figures? Are you allowed to say now without Me Too coming after you that, you know, a certain female politician, you know, are you going to get in trouble if you say Sarah Palin is, is a beautiful woman for, you know, a beautiful woman? Is that going to get you in trouble? I don't know. I got in trouble for saying that Ilhan Omar was pretty. Not a lot of, I, actually, attractive was the term that I used, attractive. Uh, I didn't get a lot of trouble, but, and I thought that was crazy and refused to bend the knee and apologize, and I thought that was nuts. It's a public figure. I said a nice thing. Sorry, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I said her politics were crazy. That I'm allowed to do for sure. But, you know, she's attractive even though her politics are crazy. That's, that's all I said. That's all I did. I wrote this on Twitter. Not, not allowed to do that. Not allowed to do that. It uh, wasn't here. I got in trouble. That was at the, I can say it now. That was when I was at the Hill. Somebody at the Hill complained about my tweet about a public figure being attractive. Okay, um, that's sexist now. I, I could have played the whole game too of like I meant attractive in persona and with charisma. You know, I could have, but you know, it's like okay, we're just, but um, there's really a there's an aggressiveness and a, a sense of evening the score that sometimes becomes a part of this Me Too mentality where liber- it's always liberal feminists want to find men to make an example of. And they are not fair-minded in this, and they there's no mercy, there's no second chance. They just want to crush. They just want to crush fools. That's what they want to do. 
And uh, I don't think that's I, – I cannot find myself approving of this approach. So Chris Matthews was a doofus, and I'm not, I, I'm not surprised that he got ousted for this. But, you know, some of the comments that they complain about as being more evidence as to why he should go, I'm like, really? You're going to go for that? But you know, now we have a thing where women in TV news are allowed to benefit very, very clearly benefit from their appearance, but no one is allowed to talk about their appearance. Same thing with men, by the way. Men benefit from their appearance in the TV news, too. Do you think, let's play this game for a second. Do you think that guy on ABC News, uh, I don't even know his name, Muir? You, you think he has that job because he's so smart? I'm just, I'm just saying, right? So let's, let's not pretend that it's only a one-way thing here. Uh, but I digress. All right, all right, I know, I know, I know. Roll call, roll call. Wherefore? out there, our, our, our roll call, which actually would mean, why are you roll call, which is not correct, but I just wanted to say it. Let's get to it. All right. Producer Mark has pulled together some of the best roll call of the day, and so I want to get to it. Laura! When's your book going to be available? I need all the tools I can get in the battle against socialism. It seems to rage more fiercely every day. Thank you for being one of the great generals in the fight. Shields high. Laura, uh, we think in the next 60 days, six to eight weeks, uh, the book is, it has been submitted. It's not very long. I didn't want it to be very long. I want people to read the whole thing. So it's not 400 pages. I didn't use a ghostwriter. No ghostwriting here. No, somebody else writes the book and I put my name on it. I, you know, some people like to do that. I do not. I've had offers. People have come to me and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to put a book out in your name. I Even people approach me and say they want to put an editorial out in my name. And I, look, I know this is not industry standard, but if I say I wrote something, I wrote it. Now, there are addendums to the chapters that I've written that are very clearly marked as such of my friends at Sansbury Research taking my political analysis and then giving you some financial takeaways from it, but it's marked as such. So you can see that. Right? That's, that's their... But everything else, everything that, that is shown as stuff that, you know, is Buck Sexton writing about social, that's all me. I wrote every word of it. I mean, maybe they edited a couple of those and us and stuff, but, I mean, I, I wrote the book. A lot of people, a lot of people in conservative media don't write their books. And they go around talking about the book they wrote. And I just, I, I can't do it. I can't do that. I, I don't know. I don't know why that's considered okay. I don't know why people feel good about that. I, I don't or I wouldn't. So that's what I got for you there. Um, Ernest. Hey, Buck. Let me start by saying I'm a big fan and patiently wait for every new episode. The other day, you were, forgive me if I get this wrong, uh, jested about Buttigieg having presidential candidacy money at about your age and then made an offhanded comment that boomers are responsible for the millennial plight. Well, I am a boomer. I never got a single freebie in life. Joined the Air Force in the early 20s, put myself through a college had a child at age 24, gave him things I never had, and he squandered a political science degree paid for by guess who to become a chef. I am fairly typical. I'm curious what millennials have against boomers. Still a fan, just curious about this aspect of the millennial psyche. Sorry you, you couldn't get a word in edgewise on Mars show. It would have been good to see them engage, but there was none of that. Yeah, I mean, they wouldn't let me talk, guys, so, you know, I don't know what. And, and unless I'm going to start shouting over the host, there's really not a lot. You know, they just wouldn't let me speak, so I, I, I said what I could say. Under the circumstances, they're all going to look very foolish, I think, if you go back and watch that episode in a month, including Bill. And I'm going to look like I'm a normal human being that thinks about things. But, for you know, when, when you're talking about a thing that hasn't happened yet, it's very easy for everybody to sound really smart because nobody knows. You know, is the pandemic the worst thing ever and is ever going to change their mind about Trump? That was what was being said on that panel. And Trump's an idiot who doesn't know how to handle it. We'll see how that looks in a month. Um... And Ernest, though, as for millennials versus boomers, look, there's always intergenerational tension. With, with the millennial stuff about the boomers is uh, that, you know, our the health care expenses that we, we we are paying taxes for uh, health care that is going predominantly to boomers. And uh, there's also a sense that, you know, the boomer generation was able to, to rise up when their various fields because their parents retired at 65 a lot of boomers have great jobs make plenty of money and they don't want to retire till they're 75 80 they keep going and going and going so it pushes down the upward mobility especially i mean in media is a great example of it you know, a lot of people think oh this person's irreplaceable in the media irreplaceable in the media 
until somebody comes along who's got a good skill set who's 20 or 30 years younger, and then all of a sudden the ratings are the same or higher, and everyone goes, oh, okay. And look, you know, look at you know Keith Olbermann. I mean, I, I, I won't talk about conservatives. That might seem self-serving, right? But you can look at uh, on, the, on the liberal side of things. There have been plenty of people that have, you know, oh, they'll, they'll never be able to be replaced. Oh, and I just mentioned David Muir, right? You know, he replaced, what was it, Peter Jennings? Ratings are fantastic at ABC News right now. I think they have like 10 million people that watch that 30-minute broadcast all the time. What's up? Didn't Peter Jennings have some sort of illness, and I believe he's deceased? No, he was I'm saying. He replaced him. Yeah, yeah. So obviously he, Peter Jennings could not still be. No, anchoring. but the point is that the ratings of the young guy who came yes, in. Are the, yeah. you, and by the way, I think Peter Jennings asterisk. might have been NBC. I'm actually thinking of who's the guy? Tom Brokaw. Yeah, that, it's Tom Brokaw's ABC. Tom Where's Brokaw's the NBC? Is CBS. No, Tom Brokaw's not CBS. Are you sure? He's ABC no, or no. NBC. I'm sure. Uh, for some reason, people wanted to hear a guy tell the news like this all the time for years. That's the old school deep voice yes, thing. Yes, yeah. it sounds like you must trust him because he has this weird thing about the way he talks. That stems from early radio days. Okay. Hey, welcome to the Buck Sexton Show. Oh, I'm just going to have the deepest voice Now you ever. just sound like uh, Alex Jones. Hey, no, that's down here. Same, that's down here. That's even more ground. Yeah. You know what? I think you're a Bilderberg plant here on the Buck Sexton Show. You're trying to do it. I know you. Google it. Producer Mark has gone over to the dark side. He is now a Soros conspiracy. He's here. I don't even know what he's doing to the water chemtrails. Is this what he actually says? Because it yes. makes no sense. Yes. And people love it. It's just putting words together in a sentence. And people love it. Yeah. You know? I mean, he's, mm. he's look. Yeah, Good for people, them. People listen to that. <laughs> he is sort of, he's pretty entertaining sometimes. I'm not going to lie. You're like, he's crazy, but it's, it's funny to hear. Oh, anyway, but yeah, and Ernest, I mean, look, don't, don't, we're just, the, the jokes with boomers and millennials, we just poke fun on each other, but, you know, my parents are the greatest people on earth, and they're boomers, so, yeah, that's, this is not, it's not, it's not said with anything other than a little bit of poking. Nick, Buck, you mentioned a couple of shows ago that you like ciders, but are worried about the sugar. Seek out dry cider, which by their nature have far less sugar than those popularized by Angry Orchard, McKenzie's, and Cider Boys. There are many craft and import ciders that have 10 grams of sugar or less. In NYC, you should have plenty of options. Um, I'll check that out. Yeah, because, I mean, I remember I had a, I had a, a, I met a buddy of mine out in, in California a, a few months ago, and we, uh, we were at a burger joint, and all they had was beer. That's like the only thing, they didn't have any wine. All they had was beer, basically, and they had one kind of cider, and it was a pear cider, and it was, Delicious, but I'm not kidding. I think it had 100 grams of sugar. Yeah, oh, it was. It was like, it was like having multiple. It was like having a you know a coke and a half. It was bad. You could have just drank water. What, where's the fun in that, producer Mark? Where's the fun I, in that? I'm just saying. Yeah, technically true. I, I should drink more water. I should drink less. Yeah, I should drink less of a lot of things and more water. Uh, Mike, hey Buck and producer Mark. When I've had discussions or arguments with people and I have refuted their position, once they realize it, they will inevitably, inevitably resort to name-calling. They do this rather than present facts and perspectives to support their position. The popular term these days is racist. If you don't agree with some crazy left-wing thought or policy, you're a racist. Just keep this thought in mind the next time you hear a news story and the person speaking uses names to call you uh, to support their position. When you do... You'll know the person saying it doesn't have a leg to stand on. Um, yeah. Um, Mike, it's true. People call you a racist a lot when, you don't have, when they don't have a real argument. It's a shame, but they do do that. Karen writes, Good ear, Buck. The upper Midwest accent and the Canadian accent, like Jordan Peterson's, are very similar. I'm from the upper peninsula of Michigan and lived for many years in Minnesota. When I moved from the, uh, to the East Coast, quite a few people asked me if I was from Canada. See, producer Mark, it's all the same up there. It's all, yeah, the accents are the same. They sound like, oh, yeah. They're just like, just come in, have some maple syrup and some flapjacks, and yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I'm I just speechless. Yeah. I'm I'm just, just, uh, see? I can't. See? He's got nothing right now. He knows I'm right. He knows I'm right. I mean, it's like you're from, you're from Ottawa. You're from Saginaw. Come on. Come on. I don't even know what those are. I don't even know where Saginaw in Michigan is. I just thought of a place that was. Uh, Ottawa is the capital of Canada. No, I, I know that, yeah. but I'm saying it's, they're close. They're and I close. think Saginaw is a 
Canadian city as well. Is it? Town, yeah. Hold on, hold on. It doesn't on. sound like a Michigan thing. Hold on a second. Let me let me get this one right. No, it's Michigan. Is it? Yes. Producer Mark, really? leave the geography to me. All right, everybody. Shields high to you.